Hello, good afternoon. How are you guys? I hope you are doing well. So we continue for our lecture classes and today um, we are going to discuss or we are going to talk about data analysis. But before uh, we go um, or introducing some of the more popular, you know, uh, and financial statistics, I think it is a good idea that we explore the basic concept uh, underlying uh, these statistics. Uh, I think um, it is uh, a must that you should understand this concept before tackling the discussion of influential statistics that uh, will be discussed uh, in uh, coming slides. Uh, so the first uh, basic concept is a sampling distribution and here you can imagine that uh, repeatedly uh, taking samples of uh, certain size let's say n equal to uh, 10 scores uh, from a given population and computing uh, the mean of each sample and then creating a distribution of these sample means so if you could take every possible uh, sample of n score uh, from the population, uh, you would have um, what is known as sampling uh, distribution. Um, statistical uh, theory reveals that this distribution will tend to closely approximate the normal distribution, uh, even when the population of scores from which the sample were drawn is far from normal uh, in shape. So thus, you can uh, use the normal distribution as a theoretical model that will allow you to make inferences about the likely value of the population mean. Uh, also, uh, given the mean of a single sample from that population. So, um, when we talk also about the sampling distribution, we always we have what we call a sampling uh, error. Uh, when you draw a sample uh, from a population of scores, the mean of a sample, or we call it M, will probably differ from the population mean, or we, our, 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 we call it um, uh, mu. Uh, an estimate of the amount of uh, variability uh, in uh, sample mean expected across a series of such sample is uh, provided by the standard error of the mean, or what we call it uh, standard error as a short. Uh, it may be also calculated from standard deviation of sample as follow. We have uh, this standard error of the mean S M equal to S divided by the root of N, where S is the standard deviation of the sample and N is the number of scores in that sample. So the standard error estimate, uh, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean for the population from which the sample was uh, drawn. Then um, also uh, we talk about another concept which is uh, the degree of uh, freedom. Uh, note that in uh, any distribution of scores with uh, a noun mean, uh, a limited number of data point yield uh, independent information. For example, if you have a sample of 10 scores and a noun means, example uh, m uh, equal to 6.5, only 9 scores are free to vary. So this one, uh, you have selected nine scores from the population and the value of the tenth must be a particular value that will yield the mean and thus the degree of freedom or DF for a single uh, sample are n minus one. Ten minus one equal is nine. So um, uh, you can uh, ex uh, extend this logic to uh, the analysis uh, of an experiment. If you have a uh, three equally sized group in your experiment, for example, with the means on the dependent variable, for example, two, five, and ten point, let's say. First is two, second five, and the third is uh, ten. So here, um, uh, then, uh, the grand mean or the sum of the score divided by the total number of the score is uh, 
10 plus 5 plus 2, which equals 17. 17 divided by 3, when we will have 5.7 point. So if you know the grand mean and the means for the two of your group, the final mean must have a particular value that is determined by these other mean. So hence the degree of freedom for uh, three group experiment are k minus one, or where k uh, is the number of groups. So in that case, we have three groups. We have three minus one. That means we have the degree of freedom is two. So the degrees of freedom are used in the computation of the inferential statistic in the evaluation of statistic, statistical uh, significance. Then um, we talk about the parametric versus and then parametric statistics. Uh, inferential statistics can be classified uh, uh, as either parametric or non-parametric. So a parametric in this context is a characteristic uh, of a population whereas a statistic is a characteristic of your sample. But a parametric statistic also estimates the value of population parameter from characteristics of a sample. When you use a parametric statistics, you are making certain assumptions about the population from which your sample was drawn. And a key assumption for a parametric test is that your sample was drawn from a normally distributed population of scores and another is uh, your data fall along uh, at least an interval scale of measurement. So the, the last requirement, you must have an interval scale of uh, measurement. But in a, a uh, non-parametric statistics, uh, it makes no assumption about the distribution of scores and the line in your sample. So uh, non-parametric statistics are used uh, if your data do not meet the assumption of parametric tests, uh, they are speci uh, especially well suited for analyzing data that fall uh, on a, a nominal or an ordinary scale of uh, measurement. So, um, uh, you see in this uh, figure, uh, uh, illustrate <coughs> uh, 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 that the top of um, uh, the, the distribution of the score from a population and below is the distribution of the two samples drawn from this population. Here, okay, this is the population and this is the sample. So because the two samples uh, were drawn from the same population, from this, these two samples drawn from the same population and thus estimate the same uh, population mean, uh, you, you would expect the two sample means to differ only because of sampling uh, error here. You can see M1 and M2, uh, you know, may, may differ, you know. Uh, this is maybe because of the uh, sampling error. But here, uh, let's consider here uh, this um, in the top now are two population. We have one population one, population two, and uh, distribution representing population of individuals exposed, for example, to the experiment and control treatment, respectively. So this is one exposed to an experiment group population. Here a control group population. We have two. Um, the population distribution underlying the experiment group is uh, uh, shifted upward and away from that the control group by the effect of an experimental treatment. So this new shifted distribution resembles the old one in standard deviation but its mean is higher here. But uh, the bottom part here uh, shows that two possible uh, sample distribution, one for the control group and the second for an experiment treatment group. So the two sample means provide an estimate of two different population means. You see, this is the first mean, but here they have two different means. Because of the sampling error, the two sample means may or may not differ uh, even though a difference exists between a population means here. Yeah. So uh, this is to illustrate what is, you know, the, the, the difference, you know, between the, sample, the sampling and the population.
Then uh, we have a statistical errors, another one. When making a comparison uh, between two sample means, there are two possible states of affairs. The null hypothesis is true or it is false. Okay? So, and the two possible decisions you can make to reject the null hypothesis or to not reject it. So, in combination, this condition lead to four possible outcomes, and this is represented in the following graph. So, as we see the lower left here, uh, hand box represents the situation in which the null hypothesis is true. Okay? And the independent variable lead or had no effect. And you correctly decide not to reject the null hypothesis. So here, correct decision. This is disappointing outcome, but at least you made the right decision. So in the upper left, uh, represent a more uh, disturbing outcome. Here, the near hypothesis is gain true, but you have incorrectly decided to reject the near hypothesis. In other words, you decided that your independent variable did have an effect when in fact it did not. In statistics, this mistake is called a type 1 error, a signal detection uh, an ex uh, experiment. Uh, the same kind of mistake is called false alarm, saying that a signal was present when actually it was not. But also in the lower right, now in the lower right, uh, we have a second kind of error. In this case, the nil hypothesis uh, is false. So the independent variable did have an effect. But you have incorrectly decided not to reject the new hypothesis. So this is called a type 2 error and represent the case in which you concluded your independent variable had no effect when it really did have one. In a signal detection experiment, uh, such an outcome is called a miss not detecting a signal that was present. Ideally, you would like to minimize uh, the probability of making either a type 1 or type 2 error. Unfortunately, some of the things that you can do to minimize type 1 uh, error actually increase the probability of the type 2 error and vice versa. Then uh, we go to statistical significance. In inferential statistics, a p-value is the estimated probability of obtaining an uh, apparent uh, treatment effect, maybe a difference uh, between samples, at least as large as the one you actually found. Given that the new hypothesis is true, by setting a criterion probability uh, for rejecting the null hypothesis, you can set the rate of at which uh, we'll commit type 1 error. So, this criterion called the alpha level, or later we, 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 we use it as a p-value. A alpha level is the probability of making a type 1 error. Uh, the smaller you make alpha, the less likely you are to make a type 1 error. In theory, you can reduce the probability of making a type 1 error to any desired level. For instance, you could uh, average less than one uh, type error in one million uh, experiment uh, for which the null hypothesis was true by choosing an alpha level of 0 0.000001. So, the, so by convention, the minimum acceptable alpha traditionally have been set at 0 0.05 or that's what we call it the p-value equal, uh, equal to 0 0.05 or five chances in 100 that sampling error alone could have produced an effect at least as large as one observed. The particular level of alpha you adopt is called the level of significance. In the difference between means yield a p-value 
that is less than or equal to alpha. So you declare that difference to be statistically significant. If you are using statistical software to conduct your analysis, the software will compute the value of the test statistic and the associate p-value for you. If you are doing the calculation by hand, however, computing p-value uh, can be challenging. So to avoid uh, this problem, statisticians create tables for critical value for a uh, popular test. To determine whether the value of your test statistic is significant, you compare it uh, to a critical value obtained from the table. Uh, if your observed value equals or exceeds the critical value, you declare your effect statistically significant. So, uh, why is one tail versus two tail test? So, the critical value of a statistic depends on such factors uh, as the number of observation per treatment, the number of treatment itself, and the desired alpha level. They also depend on whether the test is one tail or uh, two tail. So, here in the figure, it shows two examples of sampling distribution for the Z statistic. Uh, we will later uh, discuss about uh, this uh, test, their statistic. So this distribution is normal and therefore uh, symmetric about the mean. The left distribution uh, shows that the critical region or this shaded area for one day test, assuming alpha has been set at 0 0.05, this region contains 5% of the total area under the curve, representing the 5% of extreme cases in this region whose Z scores occur by chance with a probability of 0 0.05 or less. The Z values falling into this critical region are judged to be statistically significant. But in the right, you can see we have two shaded area, uh, shows two critical region of the two tail test. Using the same 0 0.05 uh, alpha value to keep the probability at 0 0.05, the total percentage of cases found in the two tails of the distribution must equal to 5, thus each critical region must contain half, that means 0 0.5, uh, 2.5, and 2.5 percent. Uh, Consequently, the z-score required to reach statistical significance must be more extreme than was the case of the one tail test. So, um, you also would conduct um, uh, one uh, tail test if you were interested only in whether the obtained value of the statistics fall in one tail of uh, the sampling distribution for this, that statistic. Uh, this is usually the case when your research hypothesis are directional. For example, you may want to know whether a new therapy is measurably better than the standard one. So, however, if the new therapy is not better, then you really do not care whether it is simply as good as the standard method or is actually worse. So you would not use in uh, it, uh, you, you would not use it in either case. So in contrast, uh, you would conduct a two-tailed test if you want to know whether the new therapy was either better or worse than the standard method. In that case, you need to check whether your obtained statistics fall into either tail of the distribution. So the major implication of all this is that for a given alpha level, you must obtain a greater difference between the mean of the two treatment groups. So to reach a statistical significance, if you use a two-tailed test, then if you use a one-tailed test. The one-tailed test is therefore more likely to detect a real difference if one is present. Example, it is more powerful. However, using the one-tailed test means giving up any information about reliability of the difference in the other. 
and test the direction. Uh, the use of one tail uh, versus two tail test has been controversial topic among statisticians. So, strictly speaking, you must choose which uh, version you will use therefore before uh, you see the data. You must base on your decision on such factor as a practical considerations. Uh, your hypothesis or previous knowledge, you should consider these two hypothesis previous knowledge to decide whether you are going to use one tail or two tail. If you wait until after you have seen the data and then base uh, your decision on the direction of the obtained outcome, your actual probability of falsely rejected the hypothesis will be greater. Then the stan alpha values. So you have used information contained in the data to make your decision, but that information may itself be the result of a chance processes and are reliable. So if you conduct two tail tests and then fail to obtain statistically significant result, the temptation is to find some excuse why you should have done one uh, tail uh, result for test. So you can also avoid this temptation if you adopt the following rules of thumb. Always use the two tail test unless there are com uh, compelling a priori reasons not to use it. Then, what is statistical power? So, remember, inferential statistics are designed to help you determine the validity of the new hypothesis. Consequently, you want your statistic to detect real population differences when they exist. So, the power of a statistical test is uh, its ability to detect these real differences. Put in statistical terms, the power of statistical test is probability that is we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false and is uh, 1 minus the probability of uh, type 2 error. So a powerful statistic is one that um, is more likely to detect the effect of your independent variable when they are present. So this, the issue of the power of your statistical test is an important one. If your statistical test is low in power, you may fail to detect an effect that is really there, leading you to abandon a potentially fruitful line of research. Consequently, you want to be reasonably sure that your failure to reject the new hypothesis is not caused by a lack of power in your statistical test. A number of factors uh, reviewed uh, uh, to that show the, 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 or affect how much power your statistical test will have. Uh, the first one, we have the alpha level chosen. As you reduce your alpha level, example from 0 0.05 to 0 0.01, or we, what we call it the p-value, significance level. Uh, here you reduce the probability of making a type 1 error. Adopting a more conservative alpha level makes it more difficult to reject the new hypothesis. Unfortunately, it also reduces power. Given a constant error variance, a large difference between means is required to obtain statistical difference with a more conservative alpha level, example 0.1 or 0.01, sorry, instead of 0.05. This loss of power is the reason we do not use highly conservative alpha levels such as 0 0.00001. Then we have a sample size. Uh, the power of your statistical also test increase with the size of power sample because larger samples provide more stable estimate of population parameters. In particular, the standard area of the means get smaller, so the likely position of the population means fall within a narrower bound. Consequently, it is easier to detect small differences in a population means and thus reject the new hypothesis when it is false. Then, 
uh, we have uh, whether uh, it is a one tail or two tail test is used. A two tail test is less powerful than one uh, uh, tail test. Uh, this can be easily demonstrated by looking at the critical values of that uh, score for one versus two tails. The critical value for alpha equal to 0 0.05 for one tail test is 1.65. Uh, for a two-tail uh, test, uh, the critical value is 196. Uh, uh, so, um, easier, it is easier uh, to reject the null hypothesis with a one-tail test than with uh, the two-tail test. Then uh, we have another uh, things that we need to see is the effect size. The degree to which the manipulation of your independent variable changes the value of the dependent variable is term uh, the effect size. Uh, to facilitate comparison across variables and uh, experiment, effect size is usually reported as proportion of the variation in scores within the treatment and the comparison. For example, the effect size of the difference between two treatments uh, means may be reported as m2 minus m1 divided by s, where s is the pooled sample standard deviation. This is based on Cohen 1988. Measured in this way, effect size estimates the amount of overlap between the two population distribution from which uh, the sample were drawn. Large effect size indicate uh, relatively little overlap. The means of population 2 lies far into one tail of the distribution of the population 1, so a real difference in population means is likely to be detected in the inferential test, which is a good power. Uh, small effect size indicate a large overlap in the population distribution and thus everything else being equal relatively little power. So, um, the last one determining the power. Because the business of inferential statistics is to allow you to decide whether or not to reject the new hypothesis, the issue of power is important. You want to be reasonably sure that your decision is correct. Failure to reject the new hypothesis can be caused by many factors. Your independent variable actually may have no effect or your experiment may have been carried out so poorly that the effect was buried in an error variance. Or maybe your inferential statistics simply was not powerful enough to detect the differences. Although alpha or probability of making a type 1 error can be said directly, it is not so easy to determine what the power of your hypothesis will be. However, you can walk backward from the desired amount of power to estimate the sample size required to obtain it. To calculate this estimate, you must be willing to state the level of power required, the size of differences you expect to find, uh, and the expected error's variance. Uh, if you want to uh, understand more about that, you can see uh, Gravanter and one, one now 2017 or Capel 1982. Uh, he has explained in details about that. Now we talk about statistical versus practical significance. So um, to say that results are significant or statistically uh, significant merely indicates that the observed sample differences are unlikely to have uh, occurred as a mere product of chance. So it is not by chance. Consequently, uh, you can have increased confidence that uh, they resulted from the effect of your treatment. Confusion arises when you give the word significant its more common meaning. Something significant in this uh, more common sense is important or worthy or of note. The fact that treatment means uh, of your experiment differs significantly may or may not be important. If uh, the difference 
is predicted by a particular theory and not by others, then the finding may be important because it, is, it supports that theory over uh, the, uh, the others. So the finding also may be important if it shows that one variable strongly affects others. Uh, uh, such finding may have particular implication by demonstrating, for example, the superiority of a new thera uh, uh, therapy techniques. In such case, a statistical significant uh, or a reliable finding also may have practical significance. If a difference is not stati statistically significant, then it can have no particular significance, no matter how big the difference is. It is not reliable, therefore, even a large difference likely uh, reflects nothing more than the effect of an uh, uh, extraneous variable on your measure. Given that your results are statistically significant, your measure of the effect size can help you to gauge uh, the practical significance of your finding. So the effect size tell you how large the effect is relative to the amount of overlap in the data from the two uh, conditions. A stronger effect stand out more clearly against the background of uh, uh, extra extraneous uh, va variation and uh, may therefore have a greater practical uh, utility. So now we talk about recent changes in reporting uh, practices. So remember standard practices for evaluating and reporting the result of efficient statistic calculation have recently been undergoing change in response to a number of criticism uh, leveled against them. One is the evaluation of the p-value by comparing its value to a, a chosen alpha level example 0.05 in order to declare whether a given effect is statistically significant or not. So this imposes an artificial uh, standard on a significance that is hard to justify. For example, why is 0 0.05 uh, to be preferred over more uh, other alpha, let's say 0 0.1? This together with the availability of statistical analysis software that can compute exact p-values had led to the recommendation to publish these extract values um, uh, uh, so that researchers can apply their own criteria when deciding whether to judge some difference as statistically significant or not. So uh, another uh, criticism against the evaluation of the p-value for statistical significance is that the result only indicates whether the evidence justifies rejected the null hypothesis. Uh, it does not indicate a range showing how large the effect is likely to be in the population. So, uh, uh, solution offered by APA for those problems. The APA offers the following solution. For a poor estimate, example samples means uh, always report an associated measure of variability or uh, a standard error. Uh, for parameter estimates, such as the difference between mean in the population, report confidence intervals. Confidence intervals replace the, the point estimate associated with significant testing with a range of values within which the true difference example between treatment means is likely to lie a 95% confidence interval, for example, indicate the range of values within the true difference will lie in 95% of cases. In addition, one can still determine statistical significance if the range of values does not overlap a zero difference, then the, the difference in significance uh, example is at 0 0.05 level uh, if using 95%. Uh, person of uh, what we call this confidence interval or CI. Uh, confidence interval we can uh, pronounce it as CI. Uh, neither exact p values nor confidence interval provide direct information as to uh, the likely size of an effect in the population. This fact has led to the current practice 
of um, uh, uh, including measures of the effect size along with traditional p-values as noted earlier in our discussion for statistical uh, power. So balancing type 1 versus uh, type 2. So in research, an alpha level of 0 0.05 or uh, 1 chance in 20 is usually uh, considered the maximum acceptable rate of type 1 error. Uh, sometimes some research they even consider 0 0.1 or 1 chance in 10. This level provides reasonable protection against type 1 error while also maintaining a reasonable level of power for most analysis. Of course, if you want to guard more strongly against type 1 error, you can adopt more stringent uh, alpha levels such as 0 0.01 level or 1 chance in 100. But whether alpha level you determine is reasonable for your purpose, remember that this number does nothing more than provide a criterion for deciding whether the differences you have obtained are reliable or not. A difference uh, is either reliable or it is not. So, if your results are significant at uh, the 0 0.001 level, they are not any more reliable than if they were significant at 0 0.05 level. It does not mean your results are more significant or more reliable uh, than a significant result obtained at 0 0.05 level. If your result are statistically significant at your chosen uh, alpha level, it simply means you are willing to believe that the differences are real. However, lower alpha level moving from 0 0.05 to 0 0.01 allows you a greater confidence in your decision about your result. But the importance of type 1 error may vary depending on the type of research and the purpose to which the information may be put. For example, applied research may be better evaluated at a less conservative uh, alpha level, for example, p-value is less than 0 0.10 or 0 0.1. If you were testing the effectiveness of a new form of uh, uh, judicial instruction on the reduction of bias against black defendant, for example, a type 2 error may be more serious than a type 1 error. If you retain the nil hypothesis when it is false, a more black defendant may be uh, convicted as a result. So ultimately, it is up to you to decide on the appropriate balance between type 1 and type 2 errors. Unfortunately, most journals nowadays will not publish a finding unless it is significant at least at P value is less than 0 0.05 level. And this is uh, uh, really one of the disappointing uh, scenarios. So now we talk about the parameter uh, or parametric statistics. As previously noted, uh, there are two types of inversion statistics, parametric and non-parametric. The type you apply to your data depend on the scale of measurement used and how your data was distributed. Parametric statistics are designed for the use when your data fall on at least an interval scale. Uh, three assumptions underline parametric and facial test based on Gravitcher and uh, uh, Wall now 2017. So the first one, the score have uh, sampled randomly from the population. The second, the sampling distribution uh, of the mean is normal. And the third, the within group variances are homogeneous. So, assumption 3 means the variances of the different group are highly similar. In statistical inference, the treatment is assumed to affect the mean but not the variance. Serious valuation of one or more of these assumptions may bias the statistical test. Such bias will lead uh, you to commit a type 1 error either more or less often than the stated alpha probability and thus 
undermine the value of the statistic and uh, as a guide to uh, decision making. So we examine the effect of valuation uh, of this assumption later uh, when we discuss the statistical techniques known as analysis of variance in the next coming slides. Then uh, we have the, uh, the, uh, the t-test. Use the uh, t-test when your experiment includes only two levels of independent variables. Uh, special uh, uh, versions of t-test for design involving independent sample example randomized group and for those involving uh, correlated sample example match pair design and within subject design. So the t-test uh, for independent sample. Here, uh, you use uh, the t-test for independent samples when you have data from two groups of a participant uh, who are assigned at random uh, to a two group. So, the test comes in two uh, versions, depending on the error term selected. The input version computes an error term based on the standard error of the mean provided separately by each sample. And the pool version computes an error term based uh, uh, on the two samples combined and the assumption that both samples come uh, from population having the same values. The pool version may be more sensitive to any effect of the independent variable, but it should be avoided if there are a large difference in sample size and standard errors. Under this condition, the probability um, estimate given by a poor version may be misleading. Then we have when the two means are being compared from uh, samples that are not independent, the formula for the t-test must be adjusted to take uh, into account any correlation between scores. The adjusted variation is called a t-test correlated sample. In such case, uh, the scores from the two samples come in a pair arising from two observations of the same variable on the same participant or from a single observations taken on each of the match pair of participants. Within subject and match, uh, match uh, pair experimental design and some correlation design meet this requirement. So we talk about the Z test. In some research, you may have to determine whether two proportions are significantly different or not. So, a relatively easy way to analyze data of this uh, type is to use a z-test for, for the difference between the two uh, proportions. The logic behind this test is essentially uh, the same uh, for the t-test. The difference between the two proportions is evaluated against an estimate error uh, variation. So, um, when your experiment um, includes more than two groups, the statistical uh, t-test of, of choice is analysis of variance or ANOVA. Uh, the name implies ANOVA is based on the concept of analyzing the variance that appears in the data. The variation in a score is divided uh, or uh, partition according to a factors assumed to be responsible for producing that variation. Uh, these factors are referred uh, uh, to uh, as a source of uh, variance. So, the F ratio uh, the statistic used in ANOVA to determine statistical uh, significance is uh, the F ratio. The F ratio is simply the ratio between groups variability uh, to uh, within groups variability. Both types of the variability that constitute the ratio are expressed as variances. However, statistician um, 
perversely insist on calling the variance the mean square, uh, perhaps because the term is more descriptive. The F ratio and its associated degrees of freedom determine the obtained p-value based on where the f ratio falls in the sampling distribution of f or no. If p-value is less than or equal to your chosen alpha, let's say 0 0.05, then your f is statistically significant at level. So we talk about one factor within subject aroma. If you use a multi-level within subject design in your experiment, the statistical test to use um, is one factor within subject ANOVA. As in a between subject analysis, the between treatment sum of square can be affected by the level of independent variable and by experimental error based on uh, gravity and world now 2017. But however, unlike between subject case, individual uh, differences no longer contribute to the between treatment sum of squares because the same subject are in each experimental treatment. So within subject source of the variance also can be partitioned into two factors variability within a particular treatment or different subject reacting differently to the same treatment and experimental error. So the contribution of individual differences is estimated by treating subject as a factor in the analysis or we call it as S. You then subtract S from a usual within groups variance. This uh, subtraction reduces the amount of error in the uh, dominator uh, of the F ratio, thus making the F ratio more sensitive to the effect of independent variable or more powerful. This is a major, a major advantage. So uh, Latin square ANOVA uh, are used uh, to counterbalance uh, the order in which subject receive treatment in within subject experiment. If the prison uh, carryover effect tend to inflate the error term used to calculate your F ratio, consequently they must be removed before you calculate F. This is done by treating uh, practice effect as factor in the analysis uh, and you can uh, have more information on the Latin square ANOVA uh, by reading uh, Kepel 1992 in page 385 to 391. Then how we interpret your F ratio? A significant overall of F ratio tell you that significant differences exist among your mean, but as usual, it does not tell you where these significant differences occur. So, to determine which means differ, you must further analyze your data. The tests used to compare your mean uh, are similar to those used in the between subject analysis. Once again, they can be either plain or unplanned. Two factor between subject and over. So, in, in this design, we, uh, two factor uh, between uh, subject and over. You include two independent variables and randomly assign different subjects to each condition. In addition, you combine independent variables across groups so that you can extract the independent effect for each factor or the mean effect and the combined effect of the two factors or the interaction on the, on the dependent variable. The analysis appropriate to data from uh, this design uh, is the two factor between analysis ANOVA. This ANOVA is necessarily more complicated than the one factor ANOVA because it must determine the statistical significance of each mean effect and the interaction as well. Now we talk about the two factor within subject ANOVA. 
all subject in a two factor <coughs> sorry within subject design are exposed to every combination of level of your two independent variable so you use a two factor within subject ANOVA to analyze these designs this analysis implies the same logic developed for one factor uh, within uh, subject ANOVA as in the one factor case subject are treated as a factor along with um, manipulated independent variable so the major difference between the one and the two factors within subject ANOVA is that you must consider the interaction uh, between each of your independent variable and the subject factor. For example, A interacted with S and B interacted with S. In Mixed design. In some situation, your research may call for a design mixing between subject and within um, uh, subject component. Uh, if you use such a design or known as a mix or a split plot design, you can analyze your data with an ANOVA. Uh, the computation involves calculating sums of squares uh, for the between factors and the within factor. The most complex part of the analysis is the selection of an error term to calculate the F ratio. The within group mean, mean square is used to calculate the between subject uh, uh, F, whereas the interaction of the within factor uh, with uh, the uh, within groups. Uh, variance is used to evaluate both the within subject factors and the interaction between uh, within uh, subject and between subject factors. If you if you uh, go and uh, and see uh, Capel 1973 and uh, 1983, uh, you will find an excellent discussion on this analysis and a complete uh, work example. So a higher order and a special case ANOVAs. So um, variation of ANOVA. Uh, exists for just about any design used in research. For example, you can include three or four factors in a single experiment and analyze the data with a higher order ANOVA. In a three-factor ANOVA, for example, you can test three main effects, A, B, and C. Uh, uh, three two-way interaction, A, B, A, C, and B, C, and a three-way interaction, A, B, C. So, it may be difficult to, uh, to inter uh, interpret uh, the higher order interaction that occur when your design includes more than four factors. A special ANOVA is used when you have included a continuous correlation variable in your experiment, such as age. This type of ANOVA called analysis of covariance or ANCOVA allows you to examine the relationship between experimentally manipulated variables while statistically controlling another variable that may be correlated with them. Again, Carpel 1973 and 1982 provide a clear discussion of those analysis and other issues relating to ANCOVA. To, to, to summarize, uh, uh, ANOVA is a powerful parametric statistic used to analyze one-factor experiment, either within subject or between subject, with a more than two treatment and to analyze multi-factor experiments. It is intended to, for use uh, when your dependent variable is scaled on at least one an interval scale. The assumption that apply to the use of a parametric statistic in general, such as homogeneity of the variance and normality distributed sampling uh, disruption applied to ANOVA. ANOVA involves forming a ratio between the variance mean square caused by your independent variable plus experimental error and the variance mean square caused by experimental error alone. The resulting score is called an F ratio. A significant F ratio tells you that at least one of your means differs significantly from other means. To determine where the significant differences occur, you must apply a special follow-up we call it 
post hoc test and we will see these when we do the practical or we do a lab session. So um, now we talk about the non-parametric statistics. Thus far, the discussion has centered on parametric statistic tests only. But in some situation, however, you may not be able to use parametric tests when your data do not need the assumption of a parametric test or when your dependent variable was scaled on a nominal on ordinal scale considered, in this case, a non-parametric test. We discussed three non-parametric tests, uh, uh, chi-square, uh, the man uh, whitney u test and uh, Wolfskorn uh, sign rank test. So you may consider using many other non-parametric tests for a complete description of this. Again, you may see uh, CHL and uh, Castellan in 1998. So we start by the chi-square. When your dependent variable is uh, dichotomous uh, decision, such as yes or no, or guilty, not guilty, uh, or a frequency count, such as how many people voted for a candidate A and how many for candidate B, uh, uh, the statistic of choice is a chi-square. A version of chi-squares exists um, for studies with one or two variables. This discussion is limited to the two variable case. If you want to see more information on a one variable analysis, I suggest you to uh, have a look at uh, Sejel and uh, Castlan 1988 and Roscoe 1975. So, um, a chi-square for contingency uh, tables also called a chi-square test for independence, is designed for frequency data in which the relationship or contingency between two variables is um, to be determined. In a voter preference study, for example, you may have measured sex uh, of a respondent in addition to candidate preference. You may want to know whether the two variables are related or independent. The chi-square test uh, for uh, contingency tables compare the two observed cell frequencies, those you obtain in your study, with the expected cell frequencies for those you expect to find um, if uh, chance alone were uh, operating. Now uh, we go for the man whitney u test. Another powerful and non-parametric test is the man uh, whitney u test. Uh, we, we use the man whitney test to evaluate the significance of the difference between two independent groups when your dependent variable is scared on at least an ordinal scale. It is good alternative to the t-test when your data do not meet the assumption of t-test when the scores are not normally distributed or when the variance uh, are uh, homogeneous. And the last one we have uh, Wilcoxon uh, sign rank test. If you conduct a single factor experiment using within subject or a match pair design, um, the Wilcoxon, Wilcoxon uh, sign rank test is a good alternative to the correlated sample t test when your data do not meet the t or the t test assumption. Uh, you can have more information uh, uh, of, the, of this test uh, by looking at uh, Siegel and uh, Castellan 1988. So also I would like to uh, 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 tell you that non-parametric statistics are useful when your data do not meet the assumption of parametric statistics. If you have a choice, uh, choose a parametric statistic over a non-parametric one because parametric statistics are generally more powerful. That is, the parametric statistics usually provide a more sensitive test of the new, of the new, new hypothesis than does an equivalent non-parametric test. 
Unfortunately, appropriate non-parametric tests are not always available for a complex design. Consequently, when designing your study, you should try to scale your dependent measurement so ANOVA or other suitable parametric tests can be used. Please, you put this in your mind. So, data transformation. Sometimes you may find it necessary to transform your data to a new scale. For example, a simple transformation can be accomplished by subtracting a constant um, uh, uh, from your data. You may do this if the original number are very large. So when you compute some statistics, a large number makes the computation difficult. Subtracting uh, constant from each score can make the number man uh, manageable without affecting the relationship with the data. Conversely, you may add a constant to each score in order to eliminate negative number. When you add uh, or subtract a constant, the shape of the original frequency distribution does not change. The mean of the distribution changes, but its standard deviation does not. When you multiply or divide by constant, both the mean and standard deviation change. Such transformation, called a linear transformation, simply change the magnitude of the numbers representing your data, but they do not change the scale of measurement. Certain statistics can be used only if your data meets certain assumption. If your data do not meet this assumption, you may choose a non-parametric statistics. Unfortunately, an appropriate non-parametric statistic may not be available. Another solution is to consider using data transformation that will tend to correct the problem. Example, by changing a skewed distribution of a score into a normal one or by removing heterogeneity of the variance. So different problems with data require different transformation to correct them. Data transformation to make uh, data conf uh, conform, uh, conform to uh, the assumption of a statistics are being used less and less frequently. ANOVA, perhaps the most uh, commonly used inferential statistics, appears to be very robust against even moderately serious variation of the assumption underlying the test. For example, Wiener 1971 has demonstrated that even if the uh, within cell variances vary by 3 to 1 ratio, the F test is not seriously biased. Transformation of the data may not be necessary in these cases. Also, when you transform your data, your conclusion must be based on the transformed scale and not on the original one. In most cases, in, uh, this is not a problem. However, uh, uh, as Kappen 1973 uh, provides an example in which the square root transformation change significantly the relationship between the two means. Prior to the transformation, the mean uh, for group 1 was lower than the mean for group 2. The opposite was true after transformation. So, be in mind, use data transformation only when absolutely necessary because they can be tricky. Sometimes the formation of the data correct one aspect of the data, such as restoring normality, but induce a new valuation of assumption, such as heterogeneity of the variance. If you must use the data transformation before going forward with your analysis, check to be sure that transformation had the intended effect. So, what are the alternative on inflation statistics? Inflation statistics cannot always be applied to assess the reliability of your result. You may have too few subjects, such as in a single subject or a small and research design. So, or you may have data that barely violate the assumption of parametric tests with a no appropriate and no parametric statistics to use indeed. In this case, you may test the reliability of your data by application, by replication, sorry. So replication means that you repeat your experiment. If your data are reliable, then you should find a highly similar patterns of results after each replication. 
Replication does not mean that you have to conduct exactly the same experiment each time. Often, subsequent experiment in series will include the condition that replicate those of the original experiment. The subsequent experiment may include condition design to test the effect of changing some parameters within the original context. The new experiment will provide the check on the original finding while providing a new information. So now we talk about using multivariate design and analysis. So during the discussion of experiment and non-experiment design, uh, we assume a univariate strategy means only one dependent variable was included or multiple de dependent variables were analyzed in a separate statistical uh, analysis. Although many research a question can be addressed with a univariate strategy, others are best addressed by considering dependent variables together in a single analysis. A multivariate strategy includes two or more dependent, uh, dependent measurements in a single analysis. So, we talk about uh, first correlational multivariate design. So, when you design an experimental or a correlational study, you may decide to include multiple measures. In this case, you are using a multivariate design. In such design, you may include multiple dependent variables in an experiment. For example, in an, ex in, in, in an experiment on the factors that affect for example, a jury decision making, you may include measure of uh, defendant guilt, uh, defendant uh, credibility, and how well the jurors uh, understand the evidence. In a non-experimental uh, non study, uh, you could measure a number of variables, some des uh, designated as a predictive variables and other as a criterion variable. For example, uh, you could analyze actual uh, trials and record the defendant race, gender, the severity of the crime committed, and the jury verdicts. You, you could also uh, then use the race, gender, and crime severity as a predictive variables and the verdict as a criterion variables. When you use a multivariate design, whether experimental or correlational, and want to analyze measure in a single analysis, you would use one of the multivariate statistics available. The first correlational multivariate design. Um, so here, uh, if you include multiple measures in a correlational study, uh, you could calculate uh, separate uh, uh, bivariate correlation. Example, uh, person correlation as uh, we uh, uh, discussed uh, in previous uh, lecture class. Uh, for all possible pairs of uh, the measures. Uh, or uh, you could use a multivariate correlation analysis in which you include all your measure in a single analysis. So you can see the, the difference, the first one you will have uh, different uh, uh, regression, but in the second only one. Severe multivariate analysis are designed to assess a complex correlation uh, relationship uh, among multiple uh, dependent variables. For example, uh, the goal of multiple regression is to explain the variation in one variable, dependent or criterion variable, based on variation in the set of factors, the predictor variables. Uh, what constitutes a predictor variable and a criterion variable is not related to anything inherent in the variable itself. Rather, you decide which variables to use as predictors based on your research question. Relevant uh, previous research theory or practical experience should guide your decision about which variables uh, should be measured and what role each variable should play in your analysis. Uh, two other multivariate techniques used to evaluate relationship in correlational uh, study are discriminant analysis and uh, uh, canonical uh, correlation. A discriminant analysis 
uh, is a variation of a multiple regression in which uh, your criterion variable is measured normally, uh, for example, uh, yes uh, or no. Uh, uh, canonical uh, correlation allows you uh, to um, Evaluate the relationship between two set of variables, one of which may be in, and identified as a predictor variable uh, set and the other as the criterion variable set. Now, in some research uh, situation, example questionnaire and test construction, you may uh, reduce the large set of variables to a smaller set that consists of, of variables related to one another. Factor analysis is used for this purpose. In factor analysis, similar dependent uh, variables are analyzed to find out if uh, any of them share common underlying dimensions called factors. Uh, you examine the, in, uh, the dependent variables that make up the factors to identify the dim dimension that those factors uh, represent. Then, um, experimental multivariate design. So, the logic of uh, univariate experimental design applies uh, to multivariate design, that is, uh, you manipulate one or more independent variables uh, and look for changes in the uh, values of your dependent variables. Uh, the major difference between the univariate experimental strategy and multivariate experimental strategy is how dependent variables are handled. Uh, when you use uh, univariate strategy, multiple dependent measures are analyzed separately with a multiple statistical test. Uh, in uh, uh, contrast, uh, when you use a multivariate strategy, multiple dependent variables uh, are combined statistically based on the correlation among them and analyzed with a single statistical test. Implied in your choice of a multivariate design uh, of our uh, univariate uh, design is that your dependent measures are correlated. Typically, you include multiple dependent measures because you have some reason to believe that these measures are important to the phenomenon under study and that those measures relate in some way to one another. Multi Variate statistical techniques take into account the correlation among your dependent measures and, in most cases, use them uh, uh, to your uh, advantage. Uh, now, we talk about multi um, variate statistical tests for experimental design. So, uh, the two multivariate statistics most widely used. Uh, to analyze multiple dependent variables in experimental design are multivariate analysis of variance or MANOVA and multivariate analysis of uh, covariance or MANCOVA. Uh, so, uh, another multi multivariate statistic that is commonly used uh, when your dependent variable is categorical, uh, for example, guilty or not guilty, is a multi-way uh, frequent analysis. Uh, as with a um, uh, univariate uh, statistic, this test helps you evaluate the reliability of the relationship between, between your independent variable or variables and your dependent variables. Then the last we will have, uh, uh, what are the advantages of an experimental uh, multivariate strategy? Uh, a multivariate experimental strategy has several advantages over a univariate strategy. First, uh, collecting several dependent measures and uh, treating them as a correlated set may reveal relationship that may be missed if a traditional univariate approach were taken. Because multivariate statistic, statistical tests consider the correlation among dependent variables, they tend to be more powerful than uh, separate univariate tests of those same dependent variables. Uh, second, because of all your dependent variables are handled um, uh, in a single analysis, uh, a complex relationship among variables can be studied with a less chance of making a type 1 error than when using a multiple univariate test. 
Uh, a third advantage of the multivariate strategy is uh, realized when you have used within subject design. A fairly restrictive set of assumptions underlies the univariate uh, within subject ANOVA that are often difficult to satisfy. So using MANOVA allows you to analyze your data uh, with less concern over those uh, restrictive assumptions. So what are the assumptions and requirements of multivariate statistics? So before using multivariate statistics, uh, uh, you must check um, to see that your data meet the assumption and requirement underlying the statistic to be used. These assumptions include uh, uh, linearity, normality, and homoscedicity or heterosticity. In addition, uh, you must evaluate your data for the presence of the outlier and the measurement error uh, for uh, sufficient sample size. We start about linearity. Uh, so an assumption underlying uh, bivariate correlation statistics is that the relationship between uh, continuously measured variables is linear. Variation of this assumption lead to under, underestimation of the degree of relationship between the variables. Multivariate statistics, which are all based on correlation, uh, even uh, MANOVA, also assume that relationship among continuously measured variables are linear. You check for linearity by uh, vis visually inspecting a scatter plot of, of the pair of the variables. If your data are linear, then all one should follow a straight line. Uh, Nonlinear data is uh, con con in construct will uh, show uh, 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 a horse uh, shoe shape uh, function. Whereas a mean uh, deviation from uh, linearity probably will not lead to a serious um, uh, and the estimation of the relationship uh, by the multivariate statistic uh, moderate to seriously, to seriously uh, deviation may. Uh, if your data are nonlinear, uh, so you may be able to correct the problem by transforming your data. Uh, you may have transfer both uh, offending variables in order to restore linearity. Uh, after any transformation, you should gain is again expect uh, the scatter plot to see if the transformation. Uh, had its intended uh, effect or no. Then uh, we have the outlier, the second one. So um, the presence of an extreme scores or outliers in a distribution can lead uh, this uh, distort the result uh, from a multivariate analysis. Uh, recall that multivariate statistics are all based on uh, calculating uh, a bivariate correlation. By correlation statistics required by fitting the best straight line to the data. Uh, this regression line summarizes the distance of the data point uh, uh, from the line according to some statistical criterion, usually uh, uh, least square criterion or OLS. If your data set has outlier, uh, the regression line may not be uh, uh, represent uh, the, the trend shown by the majority of scores. Outliers change the slope of the regression line calculated uh, from your data. They also affect both magnitude and the sign of calculated correlation. Now we talk about normality. As in the case of um, uh, with uh, bivariate statistics, multivariate statistics assumes that the population distribution and underlying your sample dis uh, distribution is normal. This is the assumption of normality. Uh, transform skewed data with one of the indicator transformation in order to normalize the distribution before using any multivariate statistic. Then we have uh, uh, homoscedicity. Homeostasticity is uh, related to a normality and is the assumption that uh, the variability in scores uh, on one variable is roughly the same at all values of the other variables. Then we have multicollinearity. A multi result when uh, variables in your uh, analysis are highly correlated. 
And the impact of multicollinearity is complex and beyond the scope uh, you know, of, of our uh, discussion now. But if the two variables are highly correlated, one of them uh, should be estimated from the analysis. The high correlation means the two variables are uh, measuring essentially the same thing. So little is uh, lost by eliminating one of them. Then the last sample size. Uh, fairly large sample size uh, are uh, needed for a multivariate analysis. Uh, large sample size is necessary because the correlation used to calculate these statistics are not uh, very stable when based on small examples. A multivariate analysis that uses a small sample may result in an acceptable type 2 error rate. Uh, this occur because unstable correlation tend to provide less reliable estimates uh, of the degree of relationship among your variables. So after that, we talk about another uh, analysis or another type of analysis, we call it uh, factor analysis, which is gaining uh, popularity in nowadays. So imagine you are intended in measuring the degree to which uh, males uh, conform uh, the male social norms. Uh, before you conduct your study, maybe you need to find a way to de define you know, just what those norms are. Um, while reviewing the literature, you discover that there are several male social norms that are relevant to male social behavior. So you decide to design a questionnaire including, for example, one-handed items to measure male social norms and administ administer this questionnaire uh, to a sample of male participants. After all, your participants have uh, completed the questionnaire, you now face the task of determining the underlying nature of male social norm. Uh, to uh, do the questions uh, on your questionnaire measure a single dimension such as aggressiveness or severe dimension such as aggressiveness, competitiveness and uh, dominance. So your research or your search uh, for the dimension underlying male social norm uh, lends itself uh, perfectly for factor analysis. So factor analysis operate by extracting as many significant factors from your data as possible based on the bivariate correlation uh, between your measures. So a factor is a dimension that consists of any number of variables. In your study of male social norm, for example, you may find uh, that your 100 question actually measures only three underlying dimensions, which is aggressiveness, competitiveness, and dominance. So factor analysis info involves extracting one factor such as aggressiveness and then evaluating your data for the existence of an additional factors. So the successes factor extracted in factor analysis are not of equal strength. Uh, each successive factor accounts for less uh, uh, and less variance. Uh, typically, the first two or three factors will be uh, strongest. Uh, for example, account for the most variance. The strength of factor uh, is indicated by uh, agent value, uh, for, uh, and you can uh, uh, study more on that in um, uh, uh, Tatsuka 1971 and uh, Tabachink uh, and uh, uh, Fidel in 2013. They have explained in details about the, uh, the uh, uh, agent values in factor analysis. So now we have also a factor loading. Um, to determine the dependent variable uh, consisting of a common factors, uh, factor loadings are computed. Each factor loading is the correlation between a measure and underlying factor. The positive factor loading means that the variable positively correlate with the underlying dimension extracted, whereas the negative loading means that the negative correlation exists. So by uh, convention, uh, loadings are interpreted only if they are equal or exceed 0 0.3. Rotation of factors. Also, after you have obtained your factor loading, you must 
uh, interpret them. The fact loading computed initially uh, are often difficult uh, to interpret because they are somewhat ambiguous. Factor rotation is used to make uh, factors uh, distinct by maximizing high correlation and minimizing low correlation. Uh, rotated factors will include more uh, distinct clusters of factor loading than unrotated factors and are thus uh, easier to interpret. So two types of uh, rotation are uh, autogonal, autogonal rotation and uh, oblique rotation. In uh, orthogonal um, rotation, the axis representing the factors remains uh, perpendicular when uh, rotated around fixed point representing your data. Uh, autogon autogonal uh, rotation assumes that your measures are uncorrelated and uh, consequently that the factor extracted are uncorrelated. Generally, uh, orthogonal uh, rotation is preferred over uh, oblique rotation because the results are easier to interpret. Uh, the most popular orthogonal rotation method is uh, very max. Uh, which maximize the variance of loading on each factor and simplify factors. Uh, in uh, 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 oblique rotation, uh, the angle between the axis and where, as well as uh, the uh, orientation of the axis in space, may change. Um, uh, oblique rotation assumes that your measures and factors are correlated. Uh, if you have a good reason to believe that your measures are, uh, are correlated, uh, oblique rotation may be a better choice than uh, orthogonal uh, rotation. So, um, uh, you, your choice uh, between a principal component and a principal factor analysis rests uh, on the goals of the analysis. Uh, the principal component analysis is most appropriate under two circumstances. If you do not have a theoretical or empirical uh, basis of the relationship among uh, variables or if you want to reduce a large number of variables down to a smaller set and obtain an empirical summary of the data. So principal Factor analysis is most appropriate when you have theoretically or empirically based prediction. Uh, in the absence of any clear information on which technique is best, you should probably use principal component analysis. Then uh, we have exploratory factor analysis, uh, a distinction also uh, is made between exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory uh, factor analysis. Exploratory factor analysis uh, is used um, when you have a large set of variables that you want to uh, describe in similar terms and you have no a prior idea or ideas about uh, which variable will uh, cluster together. Uh, exploratory uh, factor analysis is often used in, in the early stages of research to identify the variables that cluster together. Uh, uh, from such an analysis, research hypotheses can be generated and tested. Confirmatory analysis of confirmatory factor analysis also is used in uh, later stages of research where you can specify how variables may relate given some underlying uh, uh, psychological or social process. Now, um, um, also, uh, sometimes the two variables are both influenced by a third variable. If the third variable uh, was not held um, constant when um, the data were collected, it can affect the, the, the apparent relationship between the two variables of interest. However, if you have um, uh, recorded the values of the third variable along with the two or with the other two, uh, you can statistically evaluate the impact of the third variable. Uh, partial correlation and part correlation, also called as uh, semi-partial correlation, are two statistics that determine the correlation between the two variables while statistically controlling for the effect of the third. 
So the partial correlation allows you to examine the relationship between the two variables with the effect uh, 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 of a third variable removed from both of these variables. Uh, for example, uh, uh, suppose uh, you are interested in the factors relating to uh, performance of a uh, 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 scholastic assessment test or what we call it SAT. So you obtain SAT scores from 500 um, uh, uh, high school seniors, for example, as well as their grade point average uh, GPA. Uh, for you also collect data on the parents' educational level or what we call it EP. Uh, you know, or oh, sorry, PE. Um, uh, so, in the uh, in in the uh, belief that it may affect uh, the SAT SAT score. Uh, so, specifically, you are interested, for example, in the relationship between GPA and SAT scores. Uh, for example, perhaps you believe that student with high C, uh, GPA will score higher uh, uh, on the SAT than student with low GPA. However, uh, you are concerned whether parent educational level may uh, confound uh, the relationship between GPA and SAT. Uh, in a causal relationship exists between PE and uh, GPA and between PE and SAT, then any variation in PE uh, will cause changes in both SAT and GPA. What you really want to do is look at the relationship between uh, GPA and SAT uh, with any effect of uh, PE removed. This is a problem that can be solved with partial correlation. And in some cases, uh, you may want to examine the relationship between the two variables when the influence of the third uh, is removed from only one of these variables. Uh, a part uh, correlation, also known as semi-partial correlation, is used in this situation. Uh, conceptually, part uh, correlation is similar to uh, partial correlation. As with uh, partial correlation, the relationship between one variable such as SAT and the variable to be removed such as PE is determined and uh, uh, residual scores are cal calculated. This field uh, uh, and on uh, uh, SAT a score for each participant uh, with the effect of PE had constant. So these uh, residual scores are then correlated with the row scores, uh, the original one, uh, of the other variable GPA to yield the part correlation uh, coefficient. So in practice, uh, part correlation is computed by using a formula similar to that used for partial correlation. So um, multiple regression. Uh, assume that you are interested now uh, in studying the variables correlated with a college student attitude towards seeking counseling for a personal problem. Uh, you are interested uh, in investigating uh, those variables that relate uh, uh, to a student having either a positive or a negative attitude towards seeking uh, professional counseling. Multiple regression analysis is a best statistic to address such an issue. Uh, you will have a single measure of attitude toward counseling, the criteria or dependent variable, and similar measures that may relate to that attitude or we call them independent variable or predictive variables. So what are the type of uh, regression analysis? Uh, the similar type of regression analysis include a simple hierarchical and a stepwise analysis. Uh, the major differences between these type is uh, how your predictive variables are entered into the regression equation, uh, which may affect the regression solution. In a simple uh, regression analysis, the type used in the example to follow, uh, uh, all predictive variables are entered together. Each predictive variable is assessed uh, as if it had been entered after each of the other predictors had been entered. Uh, 
In a hierarchical uh, regression, you specify the order in which your variables are entered into the regression equation. Uh, you use hierarchical regression if you have a well developed theory or model suggesting a certain causal order. In stepwise regression, uh, the order in which variables are entered is based on statistical decision, not on the theory. So, when you enter variables into stepwise regression analysis, the order in which predictors are entered is determined by quantities of the sample data. So, the first variable entered is the, 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 the one accounting for the most variance in the dependent measures. The next variable entered is one that adds most to the ability of the regression equation to account for the variance in the independent uh, in the dependent variables. Example, increase R square uh, the most. Uh, the variables are entered one at a time until none of the remaining variables are significant to R square. Uh, also, uh, your, your choice of regression strategies should be based on uh, your research question or underlying theory. Uh, if you have theoretical models suggesting a particular order um, of entry, use hierarchical regression. But in the absence of any well-specified theory, uh, you should use uh, or you choose a simple regression. Uh, Stepwise, Regression is used infrequently uh, because it tends um, uh, to uh, capitalize uh, on chance. A sampling and measurement error tend uh, to make unstable correlation among variables in stepwise regression. Thus, statistical decisions used to determine uh, order of entry may vary considerably uh, from a sample to a sample. Uh, the resulting regression uh, e uh, e uh, equation may be unique to a particular sample. So multiple R and R square. Multiple R is a correlation between uh, uh, the predicted uh, var variables uh, of Y or Y hat and the observed value of Y. Uh, R square is simply the square of multiple R and provide an index of the amount of variability in the dependent variable accounted for in a predictive variables. There, there are or there is a problem with R square because of sampling error. R square uh, tend to overestimate the variance uh, accounting for, especially with small samples. Uh, adjusted R square. Uh, 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 compensate for this overestimation. Um, uh, you should use the adjusted R square as a measure of variance uh, accounted uh, for rather than the adjusted R square. Uh, you also you should pay attention to the standard error. The standard error gives you an indication of how much variability there is around the calculated regression line. The lower the value, the better is. So uh, now we talk about regression uh, weights. A regression weight uh, are used to interpret the result from multi, uh, multiple regression analysis. There are two types of regression weight, a row and uh, standardized and a row regression weight. Um, a row regression weight um, uh, is, or uh, we call it B, is calculated um, based on uh, a row score or the original score of your dependent variable entered into the regression analysis. A standardized regression weight is calculated after your row scores have been transformed to a standard error. The standardized regression weight are known as beta weight uh, uh, 
abbreviated with the Greek symbols uh, beta. Uh, so uh, when you use the computer program such as SPSS to conduct a regression analysis, you can determine if the beta weight is statistically significant by looking at the p-value uh, uh, the t-test provided. Uh, the statistically significant beta weight tells you that the predictor variable is significantly related to your criterion uh, variable. For most application in research, uh, you should use the standardized regression weight or beta weight because they can be directly compared uh, even if the variables to which they apply were measured on a very different scale. For example, uh, even though variables such as intelligence, uh, GPA, and socioeconomic status are all measured on different non-equivalent scale, IQ point, grade point, average, and uh, dollars respectively, the beta weight can be directly compared because all of the scores from these measures were converted to a standard score. This is not the case uh, for the rule regression weight. Only when your variables are measured uh, on the same standard scale should uh, you use the rule score regression weight. So um, then um, uh, we have in how we interpret this regression weight. So if the regression analysis is significant, uh, you may want to know how much the variability in your dependent variable can accounted for by a given predictor uh, variable. Uh, you may be uh, tempted to use a beta weight for this um, purpose. However, uh, you should avoid this uh, temptation because a beta weight does not tell you uh, uh, the unique co contribution uh, of a given predictor to variability uh, in the dependent variable. A beta weight uh, for a given predictor variable may be high because it directly produce most of the variance in the dependent variable. However, uh, that same predicted variable may simply be correlated with uh, another statistically significant predictive variable, making it appear that it causes the variance in the independent variable when it is the other one that is the actual cause. Similarly, the beta weight for a given predictive variable may be low, uh, and yet that predictor may have a strong causal influence on the predictive variable. This situation can occur when another predictive variable in the analysis uh, correlate with the predictor variable within the low beta weight. So the analysis mistakenly may assign weight to the correlated variable instead of the one actually uh, causing the variability in the independent variable. Uh, the va a variable that uh, masks the, the true effect of another variable is uh, termed with um, suppressor variable. An alternative to using beta weight to determine the unique contribution of each predictor is to use a square semi-partial correlation instead. Uh, the result of the uh, computer regression analysis will provide a semi-partial or part correlation of each predictor variable. If it does not automatically do so, you can request them, you know, in the software. Simply square uh, the semi-partial correlation for each variable. The squared semi-partial correlation indicates the amount of variability in the independent variable accounted uh, for by each variable. Keep in mind that the square uh, semi-partial correlation may or may not sum the R square. Now we talk about discriminant analysis. Discriminant analysis is a, a special case of multiple regression. It is used when your dependent variable is categorical, for example, male, female, or Democratic, Republican, independent, and you have several predictor variables. You can use discriminant analysis uh, to identify a simple rule uh, for classifying participants into uh, groups or determine which 
of your predictive variables contribute uh, most heavily to the separation of groups. This analysis works by forming a discriminant uh, function. So, um, more than uh, one discriminant function can link your um, predictors with your dependent variables. However, the number of functions is limited to a number of predictors or to a number of levels of the dependent variables minus one, whichever is smaller. For example, if you had uh, seven predictors, and a three level of independent variables, the number of possible function is two times three minus one and equal two times two equal four. Each discriminant function represents a different linkage between the predictors and the dependent variable. The first one calculated maximize the separation between levels of the dependent variables. Subsequent function represent uh, progressively a weaker linkage between the predictor and uh, the dependent variable. Because of the computation needed to perform, uh, the discriminant analysis are complex. Uh, you will probably use a computer regression to conduct discriminant analysis. In this case, we have SPSS uh, conduct a discriminant analysis uh, with a, uh, its analyzed sub-program. Uh, the output of the SPSS analysis gives you a similar important uh, piece of information. First, the output will indicate the number of discriminant functions extracted along with the test of statistical uh, significance. Second, uh, you can uh, request several other statistics um, need to uh, interpret your result. Uh, uh, this include the standardized discriminant function coefficient or analogous uh, to beta weight and pooled with groups uh, correlation between the discriminant function and the predictive variables or structure correlation. You can use a discriminant analysis in two ways. Uh, first, you can evaluate the amount of uh, variability uh, accounted for each uh, function. Uh, you would do this by conducting a, a dimension reduction analysis that provides uh, a canonical uh, relation coefficient and significant test uh, for each function. The squared uh, uh, canonical uh, relation correlation uh, coefficient gives a measure of the variability accounted for by a specific function by looking uh, at a dimension uh, reduction analysis uh, you can determine the significance of uh, each function and uh, uh, variability account for each Function. The second way uh, you can use the discriminant analysis is to evaluate the degree of contribution of each predictor within a function uh, to separate uh, or to uh, the uh, separation of the groups. Uh, one strategy is to look at the standardized uh, discriminant function coefficient. However, this weight, like beta weight, do not reveal how much each individual predictor contribute to variation in the independent variable. Another strategy is to look at the structure correlation, uh, which can be interpreted uh, much like uh, factor loading. So, um, canonical uh, correlation. So multiple regression um, determines the correlation uh, between a set of uh, predictors. And a single dependent variable. 
to determine the relationship between a set of predictors and a set of dependent variables, you use the canonical correlation. Canonical correlation works by uh, creating two uh, new variables for each subject uh, called canonical uh, variates. A canonical uh, variable is computed uh, both uh, for the dependent and, and, and the predict dependent and predictor sets. A uh, canonical uh, variable is uh, simply the score predicted from a regression equation based on variables within a set. A correlation between the two canonical variables is the canonical correlation. Canonical correlation does not appear much in published uh, literature because at this point it is uh, it's in, in, in its development, uh, it is a purely descriptive strategy. It, it can be used to describe the relationship between two sets of variables, but it cannot be used to in, infer causal relationship. Consequently, this technique is not discussed, uh, you know, further. Uh, maybe also you can check uh, Taba Chink and uh, Fidel in 2013 and Levine in 1977, se sorry, where they gave, uh, you know, uh, uh, very comprehensive discussion on canonical correlation. Um, an experimental multivariate statistical test. So, assume you are required to conduct an experimental for a senior thesis, for example. Uh, your major area of interest is, to in, is the development of a concept, for example, of death among school age children. Uh, you have reviewed literature and have found most of the current research uh, to be correlational. Uh, you decide there is a room for some ex experimental work in the area that you also decide uh, to draw uh, on the existing correlation research to help you develop your measures. Uh, you found that the previous research uh, suggests that a similar important measure should be applied uh, to assessing, for example, children's concept of death. Uh, so you decide to include three measures in your experiment. The existing literature suggests that development of child concept of death can be correlated by explore to experience with the concept of death. So uh, you decide to conduct the single factor experiment with three groups. The first group is simply exposed to a film about the character who dies. The second group rule plays uh, a dying animal, uh, for example, uh, and the third group, uh, control group, receives no special treatment. But after running your experiment, uh, you are faced with the problem of how to analyze your three dependent measures. Uh, of course, uh, you could simply conduct three separate uh, one factor ANOVA. Uh, uh, you are uncomfortable with this strategy because the existing literature indicate that your three chosen measures are correlated. Uh, you may miss uh, some important relationship among uh, your variables uh, if you simply use a series of univariates. In this situation, a variable alternative to use the MANOVA uh, uh, operates by forming a new linear combination uh, of dependent variables for each effect in your design. For example, for the two factor between subject design, a different linear combination of scores is formed from each of the two mean uh, effect and uh, the interaction. Then um, we have a multi-way frequency analysis. Most of the powerful uh, inflation statistics discussed uh, previously require that uh, your variables uh, be measured along at least um, on, uh, on, on an interval scale. However, there are CS situations in which you may want to measure um, or manipulate categorical um, uh, uh, variables, example, sex of the subject.
Statistics such as ANOVA, MANOVA, and multiple regression are not appropriate to analyze such, chart, su such data. Uh, for this case, multi-wave frequency analysis is an alternative. A specific type of multi-wave fre frequency analysis uh, used the categorical or qualitative variable is uh, log linear analysis. So a log linear analysis is an analogous to uh, chi-square, uh, in that uh, you use observed and expected frequencies to evaluate the statistical significance of your data. An important difference between chi-square and uh, log-linear analysis is that log-linear analysis can be easily applied to, exper uh, to experimental research design that include more than two independent variables, where, uh, where, whereas chi-square is normally limited to uh, 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 only two viable case. What are the, the application, you know, of uh, log linear uh, analysis? Uh, log linear analysis has a wide range of application. You can use log linear uh, analysis if you conducted correlational study with a severe categorical variables. Log linear analysis is well suited uh, uh, to this task. You also uh, can use log linear analysis if you conducted an experiment including categorical um, dependent variable, example guilty, not guilty, even if your independent variable were uh, quantitative. Uh, log linear analysis is also a useful tool uh, for testing and building theoretical models. In this application, you specify how variables should be entered into the analysis for the models that you wish uh, to test. Log linear analysis is then used to test the relative adequacy of each model. Finally, uh, because log linear analysis is a non-parametric statistics, you can use it if your data violate the assumption of parametric statistics such as ANOVA. In this instance, you can use log linear analysis even if your dependent variable was measured along an interval or uh, ordinal scale. However, one important requirement uh, must uh, still uh, be met. So, like chi-square, uh, log linear analysis use observed and expected cell frequencies uh, to compute your test statistics. So, to obtain a valid result, your expected cell frequencies must be relatively large. Uh, uh, Taba Ching and uh, uh, Fidel 2015 recommend having five times uh, uh, as many subjects as cell to measure adequate uh, expected frequencies. For example, if you have two times two times two design, uh, you should have two times two times two times five and each equal 40 subject to ensure sufficient large expected cell frequency. Now we talk about the path analysis. Unlike the other analytic techniques already discussed, path analysis is not a statistical procedure uh, in that uh, in uh, and uh, uh, and of itself, uh, rather than it is an application of multiple regression techniques to, 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 to the testing of a cohesion models. But analysis allows you uh, to test models specifying the causal link among variables by applying simple mul multiple regression uh, techniques. Uh, always remember that path analysis uh, is designed to test causal model, not uh, to um, uh, sift through the data for interesting relationship among variables. Developing a clearly uh, articulated causal model is crucial in path analysis. The model should not rest on firmly ideas and unsupported, uh, you know, uh, conjecture. Uh, instead, the causal relationship proposed in the model uh, should rest on the strong theoretical or empirical base. Translating theoretical uh, proposition into a clearly defined path model uh, can be tricky. You always are tempted to determine how to measure your variable first and then derive the model. So this method may not be the best. 
uh, it may limit the possible causal relationship within your model and consequently may not allow you to uh, adequately test your theory. Instead, first uh, develop a list of a causal uh, link among the variables as suggested by your theory. Then show your links among the variables in a path diagram. Uh, after developing the path model and diagram, you can then decide how to measure your variables. So the last the causal path uh, relationship, uh, the, the heart of path analysis in developing a causal model and in defining causal relationship, a causal relationship among variables can make many forms. For example, uh, uh, estimating the degree of causality. Uh, after you have developed your causal model and measured your variables, you obtain estimate called path coefficient. Then um, uh, that path coefficient of the causal relationship among your variables. Uh, so path coefficients are determined by using a series of multiple regression analysis. Each ontogenous variable is treated as a dependent variable in the regression analysis. All the variables in the model assumed to cause changes in dependent variable are treated you know, as predicted. Then how we interpret the path coefficient? Path analysis is used to test the validity of uh, the pre, pre presumed causal model. Uh, to that end, uh, you look at the path coefficient and determine whether the uh, pattern expected by the model has emerged. In addition to looking uh, at the path coefficient, which gives you an estimate of the direct uh, effect of the variable on, on, on the other variables, you also compose uh, the, uh, the path uh, into uh, indirect uh, effect. Uh, the composition can be done, you know, according to weight rules. And we, you can uh, see here, Asher 1976, for more uh, information and more details. And the last is the structural equation modeling. SME is a variant of path analysis. Uh, uh, with path analysis, uh, variables that are directly observed and measured are included in the analysis. Sometimes, however, you deal with variables that are not directly observable but rather are manifested in a number of uh, behaviors. Uh, variables that are not indirectly observable are known as hypothetical constructs. In uh, language of SEM, a hypothetical uh, construct is called a latent variable which is not measured directly. For example, depression is a hypothetical construct because it is not measured directly. Instead, we can measure similar behavior that uh, relate to depression. For example, suicidal thought, loss of energy, and sleep disturbance. Uh, you could have participants indicate how many times a week they have suicidal thought, uh, you know, rate their energy level on a 10 uh, point scale and uh, indicate how many hours of sleep they, they get a night. So each of these three variables is called a measured variable in S SEM because they are measured directly. Uh, for the values of the measured variables, you can determine the value of the latent variable. Uh, one advantage of SEM uh, over the path analysis is that uh, uh, in uh, SEM, uh, you can evaluate relationship among measured variables and hypothetical construct within the models uh, you test. Uh, with path analysis, you evaluate only measure variables. SEM is normally used as a confirmatory uh, procedure and not as an exploratory uh, uh, one. That is, you start with a theoretical or an empirical model that predicts a certain pattern of relationship among variables. Uh, uh, for example, uh, David Gapson uh, suggests that 
there are three confirmatory uh, application of SMEs. Uh, first, strictly confirmatory approach, uh, you test the model uh, to see if data that you collected are consistent with prediction of the model. Uh, alternative models approach, you test two or more alternative models to see which one, if any, uh, best fit the data are collected. Uh, a model development approach, you use SEM to develop a model by combining exploratory and confirmatory approaches. Uh, you then test the model and if you find that it does not fit the data very well, uh, you make a modification to the model and retest it. Uh, you keep doing this until you find a model that best fits the data. An important fact uh, to keep in mind about SEM is that it requires you uh, as the researcher to develop a model to test based on existing theory and research. Uh, you do not simply go on a uh, fishing expedition uh, by throwing uh, you know, variables onto the SME, SEM uh, uh, analysis and hope to find a meaningful relationship and causal relation, uh, co connection. However, as noted earlier, SEM uh, can serve as exploratory function. Even this, however, requires that you specify a cost coherent model uh, to be tested. Uh, developing a model for SEM analysis start with a verbal statement of how variable relate, example according to a theory. Uh, next, uh, you draw out a model using boxes of a overs and, uh, and arrows. Uh, boxes represent the measured variables. Uh, their names are written inside the boxes. Uh, overs denote latent variables. Uh, arrows specify the relationship among the variables, straight arrows uh, for uh, causal relationship and curved arrows for correlation relationship. So uh, to this I think uh, we come to the end of uh, today's uh, you know lecture class. Uh, uh, if you still have any question or any doubt you can uh, give uh, your you know you can put your question in the comment box down i wish that you really enjoy uh, this um, uh, lecture class but don't worry if you still did not understand some of the concept uh, we will have a, a lab session you know for this all uh, data analysis we we have discussed anova manova you know correlation uh, path coefficient uh, sem and also including time series analysis and panel data analysis which is not being discussed here thank you very much and i see you in the next lecture class